All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, we're really, this is just a, a continuation from chapter 1. There's not really much of a break. We're going to be getting into, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <clears> to <throat> be recapping a little bit of chapter 1 here as we get into chapter 2. But let's get started. Let's jump right into verse number 1. The Bible says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So Paul starts off this chapter here saying, you know, when he first came in to Corinth, because this is, this is the first epistle written to the Corinthians, to the church which is at Corinth. When Paul had, had obviously gone through that country before he ever wrote them a letter, who would he be writing it to if he didn't travel through that way first? He, he traveled through that way, got people saved, and helped establish a church, which he later now is writing to. So he's explaining here, you know, when I came to you, when I first came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, you know, this worldly wisdom and this, I wasn't this great order where I was just able to sway you because of my skills in speaking. He says, declaring unto you the testimony of God, just telling you what God has said. He says, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he's saying, all I was concerned about when I first came to you, when I first came was... The salvation, the gospel message. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because that's, that's so important. It's the most important thing. And as we're going to see later, they're not going to understand anything else that He teaches or preaches except for uh, unless they get saved. So His objective was to get them saved. Now with this letter to the Corinthians, the first and the second letter, He's going to teach them a lot more doctrine and a lot more godly wisdom. But the first thing that he made sure he did was to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, there are people that, that will claim today, very foolishly, they'll say that when you go to church, you know, the pastor should just be focused on preaching the gospel because that's all that matters, or that's the most important thing. So the, the pastor says, you know, and they'll, and they'll take this verse, they'll say, see, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And... False doctrines always come from people who like to yank one verse out of context. As you'll see, he continues on in this chapter to explain that, well, I do teach wisdom unto them that are perfect, unto them that are whole or complete. And we'll get into that when we get to that section. But he starts off saying the first thing that you need needed was salvation. Now, I don't have a salvation message every service for the church because a church is just a gathering. It's the, the coming together of believers. People already know the gospel. Every, people, everybody that's here tonight should be saved unless they're a small child that hasn't gotten saved yet. But church is not the place to just hear the gospel over and over and over again. Hearing the gospel is a place when you go out to people, as the Apostle Paul did. He went out and brought the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And that's another thing, you know, when we go out and preach the gospel, we don't go and knock on people's doors and start telling them all about all these various doctrines that we have. You know, we don't go, and, and people will criticize our church and other churches like ours for preaching hate and for preaching, you know, all this stuff against the, the homos and the stand that we take, saying that they ought to be put to death according to what our law should be based on God's law. And they'll say, oh, you need to be more loving and, you know, and some people foolishly will have this attitude like we actually go out and like, tell people that homos should be put to death like, um, like that's our goal is to just make sure that everybody knows this doctrine. No, that's not our goal. Hey, we're going to teach that. I'm not going to be afraid of it. We're not hiding that fact. That's why we publish it and put it up on the internet. But the goal is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ and to get people saved first. And then once they get saved, yeah, come into church and start hearing doctrine. Because now you can receive the word of God. Now you can understand a book that's spiritually discerned. But without that spiritual discernment, without the Holy Ghost, it's all going to be foolishness. So when he says here, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified, hey, that's the most important thing. That's the first step. That's what we need to do with, with, with all of the lost is just don't worry about getting into all of these other doctrines and explaining things. And you know, I've, I've counseled people on this before too that have friends and family 
that aren't saved. And they want to, you know, they try to explain them all these different doctrines because they have all these questions. And I, and I try to, to counsel people and say, look, don't spend very much time trying to explain all of these doctrines to people who are lost because you're just going to be wasting your time. If they bring up these conversations, amen, praise the Lord, that's great. You've got your foot in the door, though, now to go back and bring up the gospel and to get them saved. Because honestly, you know, the doctrines of reprobates and the doctrines of just, you know, being sanctified and set apart from the world and having standards that we want to live by, they're not going to really get it, even when you show them the scripture, until they uh, are saved because they're, it's spiritually discerned and they don't have the spirit of God. So what we want to do is just don't worry about all those other things. At first, just get them saved. Just preach the cross of Jesus Christ. Continuing on here, verse number three says, And I was with you in weakness <coughs> and in fear and in much trembling. In my speech, in my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul did not rely on his eloquence and his great public speaking ability to get people saved, and neither should you. Don't let that be a deterrent from going out and preaching the gospel to people. Don't, don't think, oh, well, I can't really explain things very well. I can't say things very good. Look, God's word is where the power is. It's not in the wisdom of man. It's not in the wisdom of your own words. It's using God's word. When he preached the gospel, <coughs> he did it through the power of God and not through his own power. We don't have to rely on man's wisdom. You say, oh, well, I don't have some great education. What people ask me about the history of all these other things. You don't need to know all of that stuff when you have God's word because God's word is where the power lies. We don't have to rely on man's wisdom and have to prove to people to believe on Christ using man's wisdom and man's techniques. We use God's word. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to use the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, to pierce through the heart of the man that is lost and to get them saved and to plant that seed of the word of God that can actually bring life. As we saw last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, very famous verse, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. And when you go out soul winning, you want to have the power of God upon you. You don't, want, you don't need to rely on, you can't rely on your own strength and your own wisdom. You're not going to convince anybody using your own wisdom. You need to bring the power of God. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, another famous verse, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God, according to Romans 1.16. And what Paul said, he went out, he says... I didn't use enticing words in man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith should stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ because that is the power of God. Don't let your faith reside in a man or in the wisdom of men. See, all too often, you'll have these famous preachers that everybody loves because they can speak so well, because their words just flow so smooth. And there's a, there's a man that I'm thinking of in particular at, a, at an old church I used to go to growing up, a Presbyterian church. And, um, you know, there was one man that was, he was the youth pastor, and everybody loved when he would give a sermon. Why? Because he was a good speaker. Because he can, he can get the tears to come out. He can get people to laugh. He can get people engaged and, and, and listen. But really all he was was a motivational speaker. He did not preach the truth of the Bible. He did not preach holy living. He did not preach salvation. He did not preach anything like that. He preached just feel-good messages. And you know what? That's what a lot of people are doing. And unfortunately, people will let their faith reside in a man. So then when that man falls... They're, all their faith is shaken 
Because they put their faith in a man and not in the power of God and not residing in God's word. And there are way too many preachers out there that are relying on their own strength and they're not preaching the actual word of God. That's why we have on Wednesday nights we go through the Bible and we preach through every single verse because I'm not going to be one of these preachers that just takes one verse and just talks for an hour. There's no power in that. Some people might like to hear that. Or if I was a, good, a really good public speaker, then you know, I might be able to, to engage people like, like others can do. But I'm not relying in my own strength tonight. I'm going to preach the power of God, and I'm going to preach His words, because His words are what matters anyways. Mine really don't mean anything unless I'm preaching God's word. But let's keep going here. Verse number 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So again, as I mentioned earlier, when he says, when he came to him at the first, he sought not to... Um, he determined not to know anything among them except Jesus Christ had him crucified. He's saying, but we do speak wisdom to them that are perfect. We do speak the wisdom of God. Not the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom of God. To them that are perfect. Now, that word perfect, it doesn't mean them that are sinless. The word perfect really just means that they're complete, that they're made whole. And anybody who's in Christ is made whole. You're made complete through the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been perfected in a sense. It doesn't mean you're sinless, but it means that you are whole. You're complete in Christ. And those are the ones who the Apostle Paul is saying, yeah, we speak the wisdom of God among those that are perfect. When, that's why when you come to church, we're going to give you a lot more wisdom. We're not just going to go into salvation every time. We're going to get into the deep things, the hidden wisdom which God has ordained before the world unto our glory. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And I love this verse. This is something that um, it's actually quoted in Isaiah 64 4. You don't have to turn it, I'll read it for you. It says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. God has something awesome prepared for us. And he's saying here, look. Nobody's seen it. Nobody's heard it. And it hasn't even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. You know, the Bible says that, um, and this is love that you keep my commandments. My commandments are not grievous. So if we are, if we are loving God, you know, a lot of people might claim that they love God. But honestly, if you're not keeping God's commandments, if you're not living your life according to His word, or at least you're trying your best to do so and have respect unto God's rules and respect unto God's word and respect unto God's laws, how can you say that you love Him? I was explaining this to my children last week that in order to show your love, you have to do things. It's, it's action that demonstrates the love that you have in your heart. And if they want to show their love for their dad, one of the ways that they can do that is by being obedient and listening to their dad when he tells them to do things. That will show me that they're respecting the words that I'm saying, that they're giving heed to them, and that they love me and care about me enough to obey and to listen as the authority in their life, as the God-given authority figure in their life as their father. The way that we show God our love is by listening to his words and keeping his commandments. And for those that do that, the Bible says you don't even know what God's got prepared for you. But look at the next verse. This is awesome. Verse number 10. But 
God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So we can know, because it's revealed unto us through the Spirit, what God has prepared for us. Now, the giving of the Holy Spirit is something that was new in the New Testament. This is something that, has been, that is different from the whole time of the Old Testament. All, none of the Old Testament believers were um, endued with the Holy Spirit. This is something that was given after Christ has risen from the dead. <coughs> the Bible says in John 14, Turn there if you would, John 14. We're going to see a few verses about the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, that is now given to those that believe on Christ, that indwells us. Every man has the Spirit. We all have the Spirit of man. But what has been added in the New Testament is the indwelling of the Spirit of God, the Holy, the Holy Ghost. And this was given in John when, um, after Jesus Christ had risen from the dead and then he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That is the first time that any believer has been indwelled by the Holy Spirit and continues unto this day. John 14, verse 26, Jesus speaks of the Holy Ghost here. He says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So we're seeing here one of the purposes of the Holy Ghost that He's going to send. The Holy Ghost guides us and teaches us all things. When we read God's Word, and that's what He says, and brings all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The words of Jesus, the words of God, the things that God has spoken unto us, the things that Jesus has spoken, the Holy Ghost is used to bring those things to our remembrance. This is such a benefit for us in the New Testament, and that's why so many more things are required of us than have been required in the past. The Bible says, Unto whom much is given shall much be required. We have been given so much more than those that lived in the days of the Old Testament. We have the whole Bible at our fingertips, preserved and, and perfectly kept for us in 2016. Not only that, we are indwelled with the Holy Ghost, which is going to help teach us and instruct us as we read our Bible. Hey, if you're born again, you've got the Holy Spirit of God, and He will be teaching you God's Word and instructing you and bringing His words to remembrance. So when you're in situations, when you're making decisions, the Holy Ghost is going to bring things to remembrance that God has said. But I'll tell you what, unless you have actually read them or heard them, so to speak, there's no way the Holy Ghost is going to bring that to your remembrance. In order to remember something, it had to be there in the first place. This is another reason why we do Bible memorization. We're trying to keep these God's Word in our heart so that way, that when it comes time to use those words and apply them in our life, the Holy Ghost can bring them up readily. And they're, and they're right there for us to, to be able to use. And, and the Holy Ghost can teach us so much better that way. Flip over, if you would, to John 16. Just two chapters over in John. John 16. John 16, verse 13. The Bible reads, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. Again, more reference to the Holy Spirit being given unto us that's going to guide us into all truth. All the truth that comes from the Word of God, the Holy Ghost is going to lead us into that. He's going to guide us into truth and understanding from the Bible. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, you don't have to turn there if you don't like, but I'll read it for you. 1 John 2, 27 reads, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. <coughs> 
So what the Bible is saying here, again, is that the Holy Spirit is that anointing that we've received that abides in us, it lives inside of us. And because of this, we don't, it's not necessary that a man has to reveal truth unto us because the Holy Ghost is there to reveal that truth unto us. And again, another verse that gets yanked out of context, they say, oh, well, see, I don't have to go to church. I don't need to go to church. I don't need some man to teach me anything. No, there's nothing that a man should have to teach you that you couldn't learn by the Holy Ghost on your own. However, that doesn't mean that you just should just forsake the assembling of the believers as the manner of some is as the Bible warns not to do. And then it also wouldn't make any sense if you're going to take this verse and say, well, I don't need to come to church because I don't need any man to teach me. Then why did God give some apostles and some teachers and some pastors? Why did God give those gifts? Read the book of Ephesians and it comes very clear. God has given and ordained churches, local congregations of believers to come together that is led by a man or men that are the elders and the deacons of the church to teach and to instruct the Word of God. Now, there should be nothing that a man has to teach you that you cannot learn from the Holy Spirit. <coughs> if that's the case, that doctrine is built by man. And there's so many doctrines that are out there now, like the pre-tribulation rapture, where you have to do all these mental acrobats and gymnastics to try to prop up this notion that we're all going to be raptured out of here before any trials and tribulation come our way and before the Antichrist is revealed. That is simply not scriptural. And in order for people to support a doctrine like that, you have to jump all over the place. And really, that's not something that the Holy Ghost is going to teach you. That is a doctrine of man. But let's go back, if we would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. After seeing some of these verses about the Holy Ghost teaching us and guiding us, let's continue reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, where we left off. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 10, the Bible reads, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. This is how we know these things, it's through the Spirit of God. And you know, the Spirit of God works with you even when you're hearing the words preached from the Bible in church too. That's what's going to guide you into truth. And hopefully your Spirit's going to, you know, not hopefully, but the Spirit will be telling you, hey, this isn't right. If, it, you, know, if you start getting things, scriptures brought to your remembrance, to disprove maybe something that's taught or that's preached. Say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Wait a minute, that's not right. Wait, that's not right. And you start thinking of all these verses. That's the Holy Spirit guiding you into all truth. But the Bible says here, we just read it, verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man, which is this. We all have the spirit of man. We know the things of man, the things of this world, through the spirit of man, which we all had at, from birth. But the things of God, no man knows the things of God, but the spirit of God. And the spirit of God knows all the things of God, which is what teaches us. And if you have the Holy Spirit living inside you, that's how you could even know the things of God. Without the spirit of God, you couldn't know these things. You would need a man to teach you. Let's keep reading here. It's going to be a shorter sermon, I think, tonight. Verse number 13. <coughs> which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, this is how we ought to study the Bible and to learn. 
You don't need man's wisdom to understand the Bible. You don't need to understand the histories and cultures. You know, and some people say, oh, well, in order to understand God's word in the Bible, you have to understand the culture of the Hebrews and the culture of the Romans and the culture of all of these peoples that lived during this time. And I say baloney. That's not true at all. The Bible is a spiritual book, and it's spiritually discerned. You don't need man's wisdom in order to understand a book that is spiritually discerned. You need to compare spiritual things with spiritual things, not spiritual things with man's wisdom. We have the Holy Ghost. We just got done seeing we've got the Holy Ghost to guide us in all truth and knowledge. Why in the world will we need to understand some culture from a few thousand years ago in, under, in order to understand this spiritual book? It's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. Don't let anyone tell you that you need to have these understanding to even understand what the Bible means. No, you don't. God is not using some outdated cultural references to teach us the truth. These things, God's word is timeless. We could understand the Bible without having to know all of the things that were going on back then. I'm going to compare the spiritual things with spiritual things to get understanding. And honestly, this is how you ought to be studying the Bible is if you want to understand about a topic, that's why we go and cross-reference Scripture all the time. That's why when we're referring to the Holy Spirit and looking up, we're looking up other references, we're looking up other places in the Bible where this is discussed, where this is talked about in order to get the proper understanding by comparing the spiritual things that are written in John chapter 14 and in John chapter 16 with the spiritual things that are written here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at verse 14, the Bible says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Unsaved people can't understand the Bible. And the reason why they can't understand the Bible is because they don't have the Spirit to guide them. It's a spiritual book. They don't understand what they're reading. And this is a good rule of thumb to use when you're concerned about whether a person is saved or not. Oftentimes, you know, and I have the same concern over family members and friends, and you're starting to wonder, you know, hey, I preached them the gospel. They claim to be a Christian, but they don't seem to have any understanding of God's Word. Every time a Bible topic comes up and I try to show them, oh yeah, see, look, the, the flood was a worldwide flood. The Bible says right here that, that the, the waters covered even the highest mountains. How could it not be a worldwide flood if it covered the highest mountains and everything under the whole heaven? And the whole earth was covered and, and, you know, and you could see these things and it's real basic stuff, right? You could look at that and say, oh yeah, I can see where it says that. Now I can understand people getting sucked into a false doctrine or false teaching, but when you can just open up the Bible and just be like, hey, look, it's plain as day. It says so right here. A saved person should be able to look at that and say, oh yeah, look, it does say that right there and just be able to accept what's written in God's word. But when you go over subject and topic after topic after topic with people and they just don't seem to have any understanding of what it is. You know, people don't have any, any comprehension of what a reprobate is. People don't have any comprehension of how salvation works. People don't have any comprehension on how a person who's never heard the name of Christ can go to hell. People don't understand these things. It's because they're not saved. And like I said, you know, nobody knows everything. And there's some things that, that, are, that a person might believe different on. It doesn't necessarily make them unsaved. But when you could just go through a lot of Scripture, a lot of the Bible, and there's just no understanding there, that is a big red flag that that person is not saved. Because unsaved people can't know the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. Which is also a reason why they, you know, the, the unsaved don't receive God's word. They think it's foolishness. We just got done, you know, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 really go together very well. And um, there's really not much of a separation because it's all kind of dealing with the same topic here. Of the preaching of the gospel and it being God's wisdom and not man's wisdom. And that the world looks at this as foolishness. The world looks at the preaching of the cross as foolishness. 
They can't receive it because they don't have the Spirit of God. They don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to them. Verse number 15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Again, here, here's another, another um, verse that people seem to completely ignore when they look up places like Matthew 7 that says, Judge not, lest you be judged. That talks about not being a hypocrite when you judge. Well, we need to get our doctrine from the whole counsel of God and compare spiritual things with spiritual things. So when we read a, a chapter like Matthew 7 that talks about, um, you know, judge not lest you be not judged, for um, with what judgment you, you meet it shall be measured to you again. He's saying be careful in your judgment because you will be applied, the same standard applies to you as applies to the person that you're judging, which makes sense. And that's the way it ought to be. Now, I know we live in a day where there seems to be certain people like these politicians, these real famous politicians like the Hillary Clintons out there who can break the law and the standard of the law doesn't apply to them. And they just get away with everything and it's completely out there in the public. Everybody knows about it, yet the laws don't seem to apply to them. That is hypocritical judgment and God won't stand for that. See, God's going to make everything right one day. I don't have to worry about that as much because I know that Hillary Clinton's got something way worse in store for her than what she thinks she's getting away with in this earth right now and all the crimes that she's committed. Her destruction is going to come one day. But for us as saved people, look, we need to, if you're going to judge, you know, I'm not saying judge isn't wrong because I don't think that judges is, judging is wrong. The Bible says right here, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. If you're spiritual, if you have the Spirit of God, if you're walking in the Spirit, you can judge all things. And it says, yet he himself is judged of no man. And if you're walking in the Spirit, then you're doing that which is right. And you're not going to be a hypocritical judge because no one's going to be able to judge you because you're not doing those things wrong. But you have to be able to expect, if you're going to judge someone, you say, hey, look, the Bible says this, which is the truth. Anyone can claim, proclaim the truth of God's word and say, hey, the Bible says this is a sin. You shouldn't do it. The Bible says fornication is a sin. Now, the judgment that you make on that, if you're living in fornication, guess what? That judgment's going to come on you too. You better believe that and understand that. But, <coughs> if you're a spiritual, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're not going to be committing fornication. You're not going to commit the deeds of the flesh. And that's why you're able to judge all things. Jesus Christ himself even said in John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So being able to judge is something that is given to us. Why? Because we have God's word to guide us. We have the Holy Spirit to give us truth and to give us wisdom, to be able to judge between good and evil, to be able to judge between right and wrong. The world just wants to make everything gray and just say, well, nothing's really that bad and nothing's really that good and we're all just kind of here in the middle and we're all just sinners and we're all just, you know, and nobody wants to hear any judgment coming from anybody. Because they don't want to hear that the things that they do are, are actually wrong. But we do have the authority to judge things based on God's word. Verse 16, we're almost done. Let's wrap this up. Verse 16, the Bible reads, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And this is what gives us that judgment. We have the mind of Christ. He says, who has the mind of the Lord? Who can understand? Who has that mind of God? But we do. We have the mind of Christ. And you know what? We have that mind twofold. One way we have the mind of the Lord is in, through his words. We could see his thoughts and intents of his heart that he's given unto us through his word. This is the mind of Christ. This is the word of God is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the word. We have the mind of Christ. But not only that, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. That part of the triune God, the, tr the Holy Trinity residing inside of you which also gives us the mind of Christ by guiding us into all truth 
and into all knowledge. And praise the Lord for that. What, what amazing gift that God has given unto us. That he's allowed us to have this type of understanding. And so many people are doing nothing with it. And the reason why I say that is because they're not getting into their Bibles and reading it in order to even receive the, the education, the knowledge, and the teaching from the Holy Ghost to teach them. Because the Holy Ghost isn't going to teach you things that isn't from the truth, that isn't from God's Word. You're not just going to receive some random knowledge by having the Holy Ghost indwelling in you. You have to have God's Word for the Holy Ghost to bring it to your remembrance and to be able to teach you and guide you through His words. But it still requires you to do the reading and do the listening in order to gain that knowledge. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words, <coughs> Lord. I pray that you would please help us and empower us to have boldness through the Holy Spirit, dear Lord, to go out and preach and to teach the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and to not get involved in, in debates and discussions really about, about other doctrines with people who are unsaved because it's just going to be unprofitable because as an unsaved person, they're not going to be able to receive things that are spiritually discerned. I pray to you, please just help us to stay focused when we go soul winning and when we talk to unbelievers to be able to stay focused on preaching the cross of Jesus Christ and Him crucified and not worrying about the rest of the stuff, but, but just being able to guide them into this knowledge and get them saved, dear Lord, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, which can guide them into all truth and all wisdom, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.